Welcome to this webinar entitled Newborn Hearing Screening, Improving Your Experience and Outcomes. Of all the screening procedures performed on newborns, hearing screening is often viewed as the most challenging and time-consuming. It's easy to lose sight of how important the hearing screening is to the future of a deaf or hard of hearing child when you're frustrated with the process. Through this webinar, I'd like to help you improve your understanding of hearing and hearing screening, provide some technical information about how it's performed, and some tips for making the hearing screening easier and faster. I'll also discuss its importance to the future of a deaf or hard of hearing child. After this webinar, you'll be able to explain why early identification of deaf or hard of hearing newborns is important. Name two techniques used to screen the hearing of newborns. Describe the basic physiology of the hearing pathways response to the two screening methods. Identify at least two environmental conditions that can interfere with hearing screening and ways to control them. Explain the role of baby state on the hearing screening process. And list at least two tips and tricks to help you achieve high quality screening results in the shortest time. Later in the presentation, I'll be talking about the methods for hearing screening with references to the anatomy and physiology of the hearing pathway. In preparation for that, I'd like to show you a short video that reviews the hearing pathway. This video was produced by Boystown National Research Hospital. Sounds are all around us. We hear when these sounds pass through the outer, middle, and inner parts of our ears, sending thousands of tiny vibrations up to our brain for interpretation. First, sound travels through the outer ear canal and makes the eardrum move. When the eardrum moves, the three middle ear bones vibrate. This vibration creates movement of fluid in the inner ear, also known as the cochlea. The fluid movement causes sensory receptors in the coiled-shaped cochlea to send a signal along the auditory nerve to the brain. And this is how we hear. The normal hearing pathway is developed in a fetus by 25 weeks gestational age. The fetus hears the sounds of the mother's body and some outside sounds, though they're muffled by the amniotic fluid. Most significantly, the baby hears the mother's voice. So the process of learning based on auditory input starts even before birth. Conditions or malformations in any part of the hearing pathway can be the source of the inability to hear or process sound. Did you know that more babies are born deaf or hard of hearing than are born with any of these other conditions? You may have trouble believing this because those other physical conditions are visible to you immediately when you interact with the baby. You can see it with your own eyes and you remember those babies. But a deaf or of a hard of hearing baby typically has no visible characteristics that you can see. Unless the baby has other outward signs like an undeveloped outer ear or some physical findings associated with a syndrome that includes deafness, there'll be no visible indication that this baby is deaf or hard of hearing. And to top that off, you, as someone who screens the baby but doesn't see the ultimate outcome of the follow-up, have absolutely no idea which babies or how many you've screened have been diagnosed with permanent hearing loss. This probably skews your perception about how common hearing loss is in newborns. Here's some additional information you may find interesting. Between one to three out of every 1,000 babies born are deaf or hard of hearing. The prevalence is about 10 times higher in the NICU population. That means that 5,000 deaf or hard of hearing babies are identified annually in the U.S through newborn hearing screening. 95% of deaf or hard of hearing babies are born to hearing parents. Approximately 30% have an associated syndrome. 
Of the identified babies who don't have a syndrome, approximately 40% have a recessive gene that's responsible for their inability to hear. Other causes of deafness are birth trauma that causes anoxia or lack of oxygen and the need for mechanical ventilation, ototoxic medications, other conditions such as pulmonary hypertension, RH incompatibility, some maternal or infant infections such as rubella, cytomegalovirus, and others you see listed here can cause hearing loss at birth and are also associated with progressive hearing loss. This means that the baby may be born with typical hearing and pass the hospital screening, but the hearing loss develops in the following months due to these conditions. The Joint Committee on Infant Hearing, or JCIH, is a group including pediatricians, audiologists, ear, nose, and throat specialists, and educators that periodically publishes guidelines for newborn hearing screening and early hearing detection and intervention programs. That's commonly called EDI programs, E-H-D-I. The JCIH recommends that babies with risk factors for progressive hearing loss should be monitored for hearing loss even if they've passed the newborn hearing screening. The 2019 JCIH position statement provides a list of these risk factors and recommendations for the timing of diagnostic follow-up for these babies. We've established that hearing loss is relatively common in newborns compared to other birth conditions. Now, why is it so important that we identify it early? Well, good hearing is the foundation for speech and language development. The first two years of life is a critical period for brain development related to speech and language learning. If a baby is unable to hear, it's very important that we identify this early so that intervention can begin. Before newborn hearing screening became standard of care in the U.S., deaf and hard of hearing babies were not identified on average until age two and a half or three years, beyond that critical period for brain development for language. And those with milder degrees of hearing loss were often not identified until their first hearing screening in kindergarten. Deaf and hard of hearing children who were identified late typically showed significant delays in speech and language development, and many would never catch up to their hearing peers. Mainstreaming of late identified children into a regular classroom with hearing peers was not very successful, requiring special dedicated classrooms for their entire school experience. Children with late identified unilateral hearing loss typically had fallen behind their peers by two years in math, language, and social development by the third grade, even though hearing was normal in one ear. With newborn hearing screening, deaf and hard of hearing babies can be identified, sent for full diagnostic evaluation, and begin receiving intervention by six months of age. Based on studies like the one shown at the bottom of this slide, the 2019 JCIH position statement included this citation about the benefits of early detection and intervention. With early detection and appropriate targeted intervention, developmental milestones for an infant who is deaf or hard of hearing can be expected to be achieved more accurately reflecting the child's true potential. In 1999, a landmark study was published that compared deaf and hard of hearing children identified before six months to those identified later. Those that received intervention before six months of age had language skills equal to their normal hearing peers by three years of age. This led to widespread adoption of the 136 goals for early hearing detection and intervention. That means screen before one month diagnose before three months, and start early intervention before six months. In the 2019 position statement published by the Joint Committee on Infant Hearing, they suggested that states who had achieved the 136 guidelines 
should now strive to meet a one to three month timeline so that intervention can begin even earlier than six months. Recognizing the importance of identifying deaf or hard of hearing babies as early as possible led to the practice of universal newborn hearing screening in the U.S. Some states began mandating it in the middle 1990s. 43 states now have statutes or other regulatory language that requires it. At this time, about 95% of babies are screened before hospital discharge. You might be interested to know that about 75% of those are screened by a hospital employee, such as a staff nurse or CNA. Around 25% are screened by employees of newborn hearing screening service providers under contract to the hospital. Another 1.5% are home birth infants screened by a midwife or public health nurse either at birth or sometimes at a two-week follow-up. Hearing screening is performed using devices that automate a process for assessing the hearing pathway and have built-in algorithms for deciding whether the hearing pathway is generating the expected result. These algorithms are designed to have very high accuracy. The results are presented as either a pass or a refer or some symbol representation. A pass means that it's unlikely that hearing loss is present. A refer means that hearing loss can't be ruled out and more testing is needed. There's no need for anyone to interpret the results and it's inappropriate for anyone to second guess the automated outcome of the screening. There's no such thing as close enough to a pass. A refer is a refer. At this point, I'd like to turn the discussion toward more practical aspects of performing hearing screening. In the next slides, I'll cover recommendations about when the screening should be performed, thoughts about the screening location, and recommendations for practices that lead to screening success, meaning good quality screening in the fastest time. I'll review recommended rescreening procedures and discuss equipment maintenance. There are many opinions about when to screen. Your hospital may already have very specific policies and procedures in place addressing this issue, and you should of course follow those rules. In general, however, many agree that you should wait to screen until the baby's at least 24 hours old if possible. This allows the ears time to dry out and avoids false refers due to vernix or liquid in the canals. If this isn't possible, wait as long as you can, but be sure to leave sufficient time so that if the baby refers, you still have time for a rescreen. It's good practice to wait to rescreen at least four hours after the initial refer to give more time for the ears to clear. Some programs screen very early and certainly there's a period of time shortly after birth where the baby is very quiet and seems ideal for screening. The problem is that you may experience a high refer rate and need to rescreen because the ear canals are still blocked. Where should the hearing screening be performed? The Baby Friendly Initiative recommends rooming in for newborns with minimal time away from mom. This means that hearing screening is being performed more and more frequently in the mother's room rather than in a nursery or procedure room. So often there's no choice to be made regarding screening location. The challenge wherever the screening takes place is to manage conditions in the room so you can achieve a good quality test. If you've had a hearing test before, you know that they're typically performed in a sound-treated room so that background noise won't interfere with your ability to hear low-level sounds. Background noise can be so loud that you can't hear soft sound even though you have normal hearing. Well, the same holds true even with newborn hearing screening. If the noise is too loud, the baby won't hear the screening stimulus. Of course, we can't transport every baby into a sound booth but we can try to control the noise as much as possible. To control the background noise, you'll need to manage the situation in the test room. 
For example, it's probably wise to avoid screening when there are lots of visitors in the mom's room. Screening will go more smoothly if you explain to mom and anyone else present that getting a good test requires that the room remain as quiet as possible throughout the entire screening. This means no talking. It means turning off the sound on devices like the TV or tablets or phones. If there are child visitors who are too young to control themselves, perhaps they can be taken out for a walk. It's best to close the door to hallway noise. If you identify other sources of noise in the room, like from the heating or air conditioning vents, try to move as far away from these as possible. Baby state can make or break the hearing screening. It's really that important. Choosing the time to screen when the baby has just been fed, freshly diapered, and is sleeping comfortably will improve screening success. Swaddling to calm the baby and restrict arm movements is highly recommended. Turning off the lights and placing an extra blanket from the warmer on the baby can help to settle them. Now, unfortunately, there's always some preparation for the screening that involves disturbing the baby from this ideal state. But after you've prepped the baby and are ready to begin the screening, observe and wait. Wait to start the screening until the baby has completely quieted again. This could be one to two minutes. The time spent will be rewarded with a much faster test most of the time. If you begin the screening when the baby's awake, moving, and hasn't settled down from being disturbed by the test preparation, you're allowing the screening system to start the recording with poor quality data. It's going to take longer for the system to overcome this period of recording bad data than the time you would have invested in swaddling the baby, being patient, and waiting for the baby to calm down. I'd like you to adopt the wait technique. It'll pay off in the long run. The wait technique can also be used during the screening. If the baby has been quiet and the test has been progressing well, but then the baby wakes up and begins to fuss or move, use the wait technique and remember that the pause button on your hearing screening device is your friend. Pause for as long as it takes to calm the baby. If you don't pause when the babies become fussy, then poor quality data being recorded during this fussy time will compromise the good data you've already collected and testing will take longer. If you've waited and tried everything you can think of to calm the baby, but the baby is still too fussy to proceed, it's probably more efficient and less frustrating to stop and come back later when the baby's settled. Don't let the screening system just run under bad conditions just so you can finally achieve a refer. A screening performed under bad conditions is not a valid test. It would be like performing a vision test with a blindfold on. The results mean nothing if the test conditions are not acceptable. It's common practice to perform a second screening before hospital discharge if a baby refers in one or both years of the initial screen. I mentioned earlier that it's a good idea to wait at least four hours to perform the rescreen to give the ears more time to dry out. There are some other good practices to follow for the rescreen. The Joint Committee on Infant Hearing guidelines recommend that a rescreen should always include testing of both ears, even if one ear passed on the initial screen. The reason this recommendation was made is because on follow up testing, a significant number of babies who were discharged with a refer in only one ear were found to have hearing loss in both ears. The concern is that a documentation mix up when combining screening results from multiple test sessions could let a deaf or hard of hearing baby slip through the cracks. As a product manager for newborn hearing screening equipment, sometimes I'm asked to consult on issues customers have with their database of tests. I've been surprised at times to observe as many as 20 screening sessions documented for a baby. I've seen instances where there are 10 refers and then one single pass. 
I have to assume that it's possible that this baby was discharged based on that final pass after 10 refers. That's a very disturbing thought. Our hearing screening methods have very high sensitivity at detecting hearing loss with an accuracy over 99%, but none of the methods or devices are 100% accurate. That means that rarely but occasionally the screening test will pass a baby with hearing loss. The more times you screen the same baby over and over again, the more likely you are to end up with a false pass. If you took 10 at-home pregnancy tests and 9 were positive and 1 was negative, would you trust that negative test and assume you were not pregnant? I doubt it. A baby should not be screened more than two times with good quality test conditions. As with any task, people become more proficient and successful with hearing screening the more they do it. In some ways, performing hearing screening is as much of an art as it is a science. Think of it like you would think of inserting an IV for a baby. Is every nurse in your unit equally successful at it? Probably not. You probably have a handful of nurses that are your go-to people for inserting an IV. In my view, hearing screening is similar. Some people are really good at it, and some find it challenging. From observing hundreds of hospitals' hearing screening programs over many years, I can tell you that trying to have 60 or more staff members perform hearing screening is typically not successful. To administrators who are in charge of a newborn hearing screening program, I would suggest identifying a cohort of 5 to 10 staff members covering all shifts and make them responsible for all hearing screening. The fewer people you have screening, the better. Choose individuals who have demonstrated they can be successful and efficient. Your program will benefit from it, I can almost guarantee you. Another part of running a successful screening program is practicing good equipment maintenance. Each screener should be sure to remove and discard the single-use disposables from the system. After each screening, clean and disinfect the components that touch the baby or the baby's bedding following the manufacturer instructions. Always place components and cords in a safe place when the system is not in use or during transport so that you don't step on or run over parts of the system. Avoid wrapping cables in a way that puts undue stress on them. I'd suggest that the newborn hearing screening administrator assign one person to regularly inspect the equipment components for wear and damage paying particular attention to cords and any rubber or vinyl parts that can harden or crack with repeated exposure to disinfectants. For some items, keep spares on hand so you can avoid interruption of screening and babies being discharged without being tested. The two methods used for newborn hearing screening are automated auditory brainstem response abbreviated AABR, and automated otoacoustic emissions, typically abbreviated OAE, either distortion product OAE or transient evoked OAE. Automated ABR assesses the hearing pathway all the way up to the auditory nerve in the brainstem. Conditions anywhere in the pathway through the brainstem will cause there to be no measurable response on the hearing screening ending up with a refer result. The OAE test assesses the hearing pathway through the outer hair cells in the cochlea. What does that difference in the techniques mean in practical terms? Some studies have shown that the majority of permanently deaf or hard of hearing babies have a cochlear type hearing loss. However, there is a subset of babies that have normal cochlear function but have hearing pathway conditions of the auditory nerve. The term used to describe this condition in the literature is auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, abbreviated with the initials ANSD. This condition is a relatively recent discovery and there's still much about it that's not fully understood, including the frequency of its occurrence. 
Various studies suggest that ANSD is present in somewhere between 1.2 to 10 percent of deaf and hard of hearing babies. ABR screening will detect all of these babies, those with ANSD as well as those with cochlear hearing loss, because ABR tests the hearing pathway through the brainstem, including the auditory nerve. Now let's look to OAE screening. Let's say that each baby shown here is deaf or hard of hearing. OAE screening will detect the babies with cochlear hearing loss, but will miss the deaf or hard of hearing babies who have ANSD. Those babies will pass the OAE due to normal cochlear function and will be discharged with undetected hearing loss. To try to reduce the number of babies with ANSD that are undetected, it's become common practice to use automated ABR in the NICU as the primary screening method. The Joint Committee on Infant Hearing recommends this and most states require it. Many of the babies with ANSD have a birth history that's landed them in the NICU, and so automated ABR used there should detect most of these babies. Nevertheless, some babies who are deaf or hard of hearing due to ANSD will be missed when screened with OAE in the well baby population. What exactly is an otoacoustic emission? You know it's a technique for hearing screening now. You know it detects cochlear type hearing loss. You probably know that it requires placement of a probe with a disposable tip into the baby's ear canal but do you have any idea how it really works? It's actually quite interesting. A speaker in the ear probe delivers a very specific sound into the baby's ear canal. This sound stimulates the hearing pathway through the outer ear, middle ear, and into the cochlea where movement of fluid inside the channels causes movement of tiny structures called outer hair cells. That mechanical activity of the outer hair cells generates energy that's sent backwards out of the hearing pathway. That reverse process produces a very soft sound that's picked up by a microphone in the ear probe. That sound is the otoacoustic emission. The OAE is not the only thing that the microphone records. It records all sound that's present in the ear canal. So the OAE device has to process what it's recorded to be sure that there's really an OAE buried in there. The device knows exactly what it's looking for as an OAE response and applies sophisticated processes to see if the OAE is present. It compares the OAE it measures to criteria that must be met to ensure that it's large enough to be consistent with normal hearing. When the criteria are met, then the screening ends with a pass. It can be very fast if conditions are good and the baby has a robust OAE. If no OAE is recorded or if it's too small or overwhelmed by background noise, then the test eventually ends in a refer. I mentioned earlier that there are two types of OAEs, distortion product and transient evoked OAEs. The two have some methodology differences in terms of the acoustic stimulus that's used and in turn how that interacts with the physiology of the cochlea to produce the response. I'm often asked which one should I use for newborn hearing screening and why are there two different methods? I like to explain this using the analogy of cooking with an electric versus a gas cooktop. Both cook your food with heat. Many feel that gas is better because you can control the heat more precisely and when you turn the burner off the cooking stops immediately. And maybe for certain dishes those features are important. But if you're just boiling water it really doesn't matter if you use gas or electricity. The same is true in the choice of DPOAE or TEOAE. Both test the hearing pathway up to the cochlea. In a clinical setting where diagnostic testing is performed, 
the audiologist may choose one or the other depending on exactly what the goal is, where one may actually be better than the other. But if the goal is to screen for hearing loss, it doesn't matter which you use. Either technique is appropriate. That said, I have found that there are regional or state preferences for one versus the other, and these preferences are sometimes reflected in the state mandates or recommended procedures. Your program should follow your state's guidelines if there are specific requirements. Here are some suggestions for best practice for OAE screening. The fit of the probe in the baby's ear is critical for getting a good test. Look at the baby's ear canal to see if there's obvious liquid or vernix near the opening. If there is, wipe it away with a cloth. Liquid near the outside means there may also be debris still in the ear canal. You can massage the area in front of the ear canal and this may move the liquid to clear a path for the sound. As you look at the canal, also note the size so you can choose an appropriate ear tip to place on the probe so that it's tight enough in the ear canal. Pull gently down and out on the ear to straighten the canal and while doing that, insert the ear tip with a little twisting motion. Release the ear so that it settles around the probe and then release the probe. The fit should be secure and deep enough to stay in place on its own. You must not hold the probe since you'll introduce noise. Finally, as you're inserting the probe, also think about the positioning of the cable. Any movement of the cable during the test will cause noise. Position it so that it lays untouched. During the OAE screening, you'll have to watch to be sure that movements of the baby's head don't cause the probe to come out of the ear. Swaddling is really important so the baby can't swipe the probe with flailing arms or get a hold of the cable to pull the probe out of the ear. Besides good probe fit, the other techniques we discussed earlier all apply for OAE screening. Manage the environment and the baby to be as quiet as possible. As I mentioned, the instrument's microphone that records the OAE also picks up outside noise that can negatively influence the test outcome and time for testing. The more other noise there is, the harder it is for the device to detect the OAE. Also, use the weight technique after inserting the probe. Give the baby ample time to calm down and don't start the screening until the baby is quiet. Don't be afraid to use the pause control on your device right away if the baby becomes fussy during the screening. Pause and wait to continue until the baby quiets. This will prevent bad noisy data from ruining what you've already collected. Now let's talk about automated ABR the other, more commonly used technique for hearing screening in the U.S. You'll recall that it identifies babies with cochlear hearing loss as well as auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. It involves skin preparation and placement of three recording sensors or electrodes with wires attached onto the baby's skin. In general, there are two options for placement of the sensors. Very common is placement on the center of the forehead below the hairline, the back of the neck or nape below the hair, and one sensor on the cheek or shoulder. A frequently used alternate placement of the electrodes is forehead and behind each ear. Check with your device manufacturer to determine what's appropriate for your system. The other preparation task is to position the transducer which is the part that delivers the stimulus and sends sound into the ears. Different screening devices use different types of transducers. Some surround and cover the ear, and some have ear tips that are inserted directly into the ear canal. In either case, the important thing is to achieve a good, secure fit so that the sound is getting into the ear canal with no leaks that can reduce the level of the stimulus and so that it stays securely in place for the entire test. 
Okay, so you know that ABR requires placement of electrodes and some type of transducer to get the sound into the baby's ear. But how does it really work? The hearing screening device delivers a soft sound through the transducer and into the baby's ear. As we've seen before, this sets up a chain reaction through the hearing pathway up to the hearing nerve in the brainstem and causes the hearing nerve fibers to fire, which produces electrical activity. That's the ABR. The electrodes placed on the baby's head records all of this ongoing nerve activity that's happening in the brain, which includes the tiny ABR, but also includes lots of other brain activity, the EEG. The activity recorded by the electrodes is sent on for processing to the device. The sophisticated part of what the device does happens after that, even though what you see on the device may be quite simple, something similar to what you're seeing here. But behind the scenes, the device processes the EEG in order to try to tease out this tiny ABR buried in all of the other unrelated brain activity. The system applies automated algorithms to the data it's processing to determine if the ABR is present. When the criteria are met indicating that an ABR is present, then the system assigns a pass. If no ABR is present or it's too small compared to the other background EEG noise, then the system will eventually give up and assign a refer. Remember that the system electrodes are trying to pick up and process a very tiny electrical response from the baby's hearing pathway. Those electrodes also pick up other electrical responses from the body, such as muscle movements, sucking activity, and eye blinking. The more active the baby is, the harder it is for the system to detect the ABR because it's overwhelmed by all this additional electrical activity. So, for ABR, baby state is critical for achieving a good, fast test. Remember the wait technique and that pausing when the baby becomes restless also applies to ABR screening. The screening can also be negatively impacted by electrical interference from other devices near the baby or test device. For example, other monitors attached to the baby or pagers, cell phones, and tablets that are nearby can cause recording problems. Sometimes there can be electrical interference from hospital equipment in other rooms or different floors of the hospital. For example, if you're close to the MRI or CT labs or to floors where construction is taking place. Electrical noise can be one of the most difficult problems to identify and troubleshoot. Most screening devices display feedback about the quality of the data coming into the electrodes. If you see that the data is noisy and you're sure the baby is not causing it, then check around for these other possible sources of electrical interference. Turn off cell phones, overhead lights, and other non-critical devices in the room to see if that reduces the noise interference. Sometimes there are hot spots in a room where electrical interference seems to converge. You might try to move to the other side of the room to see if conditions improve. A very important variable in controlling interference from electrical noise is to clean and prep the baby's skin before placing the electrodes. This is one of the single most important tasks you'll perform to set the stage for a good quality and fast ABR screening test. There are a variety of electrode skin preparation products available. Your hospital probably has its preferred products and some may not be allowed at your facility. Be sure to follow your hospital's rules about skin prep products. Whatever you use, the goal is to achieve the best contact of the electrodes to the baby's skin. This involves massaging the product into the skin, rubbing it in 10 to 15 times at each of the three electrode locations. Then you may need to wipe off some of the residue so that the disposable electrode will still stick to the baby's skin and not slip off. 
ABR devices typically display feedback about the quality of the electrode contact to the baby's skin, or what's called the impedance values at the start of the screening. Here you'll see traffic lights across the top and values along the bottom of the screen. Most devices will not start the actual ABR screening until the impedances meet some criteria. Different manufacturer systems may recommend different values. The lower the value and the more equal the values are to one another from the electrode spots, the better. Achieving low, balanced impedances can improve the quality of the ABR recording, reduce the impact that electrical noise has on the test, and reduce your test times. The time you spend cleaning the skin before applying the electrodes is well worth it. Don't skimp on this step. Regardless of the technique used for screening, in the end the baby is discharged with either a pass or a refer result. Your hospital newborn hearing screening program or state early hearing detection and intervention program probably has provided some pamphlets or a handout to inform parents about the results and the recommendations for next steps. Or you may even have a script to follow when discussing the results with the parents you definitely should follow the procedures that your hospital has in place. No one likes to give news that a parent may perceive as bad news, and parents are likely to have questions when a baby is being discharged with a refer hearing screening result. I urge you to stick to the script or guidance you were given by your newborn hearing screening administrator. They've probably thought very carefully about the message they want to give the parents. Avoid downplaying the refer result if you do go off script to answer questions. Statements such as, don't worry, it's probably fluid in the ear and it'll clear up in a few days. Or, I wouldn't worry about it, most babies pass the rescreen when they go for their follow-up. Those may be perceived by the parent as, the test is worthless and I don't really have to follow up. State programs have the responsibility to follow up on every baby who leaves the hospital with a refer result. The single most frustrating challenge they face is loss to follow up, or LTF statistics. This means that the parent did not follow up on the recommendation to bring the baby in for the rescreen. And meanwhile, time is ticking away for that deaf or hard of hearing baby who needs to get the services to meet the 136 goals so that intervention can begin as soon as possible. You can influence the decision that the parent will make about the follow-up screen with your words. Choose them carefully. Babies who are discharged with a refer screening result are referred or scheduled for follow-up testing. The Joint Committee on Infant Hearing recommends that NICU babies with a refer result should go straight for diagnostic audiology testing rather than a rescreen because of the higher risk of hearing loss in that population. Well babies are sometimes scheduled to come back to the birth hospital as an outpatient or are referred to a local audiology clinic for a rescreen. In some areas, for a well baby that's referred, the child's primary care doctor or a public health clinic may be informed of the results and can perform an OAE rescreen. The final screening results at the time of discharge are communicated to your state's agency that's responsible for the early hearing detection and intervention program. This occurs either by manual entry or electronic transfer of screening results into a state database or by use of blood spot cards or by fax to the state. The state makes every attempt to achieve follow-up on babies who did not pass the screening so that the 136 goal can be achieved. I've covered a lot of material today. We've reviewed the hearing pathway and how it works. We've discussed the causes of hearing loss and how commonly it occurs in newborns compared to any other conditions. I provided information about how critically important it is that deaf and hard of hearing babies be identified as early as possible so that the goal of 136, that is screen by one month, 
diagnose by three months, start intervention by six months can be achieved. We reviewed many practical suggestions you can implement to improve your screening experience and outcomes, such as when to screen, how to control the noise in the test room, ideas for managing baby state, which is so critical to achieve a good quality test, and how the weight technique can change your screening outcomes. We reviewed the basics about automated ABR and OAE, how they actually work, and what they can and can't detect in terms of different hearing loss types. I've talked about how important it is to achieve good probe fit for OAE and to perform adequate skin prep for ABR. I've reviewed what happens after the screening and emphasized how important the messaging provided to parents can be to guide their decision about whether to follow up with the rescreen. Nurses and other hospital staff caring for new moms and babies have so much to accomplish during a very short hospital stay. Newborn hearing screening is just one of many tasks and it can be very challenging and very time consuming. I ask you to try a few of the suggestions I've discussed the next time you screen to see if they can make the process easier and faster. I hope I've shown you that despite the challenges you face in performing the hearing screen, the outcome of identifying a deaf or hard of hearing baby early can have a profound impact on the baby's future. You, as the one performing the screening, serve a critically important role as the gateway for directing the path of that child towards the intervention they need. I'd like to acknowledge that the two videos shown in this presentation were produced by the first two organizations listed here and were taken from these websites. I've also referenced the Joint Committee on Infant Hearing several times. This is their website. All three of these websites offer much more information on a variety of topics related to newborn hearing screening. I direct you to these sites if you're interested in knowing more. Thank you for your attention today.